So, um, my talk. Uh, it's designing, uh, you, yeah, you can read it, right? In three, three point five simple steps. Um, so I, um, a little bit about myself. Um, so, uh, my name is Nunu Pinheiro. I, um, I've been doing this for a few years. I started up, um, working at, uh, with Kitty. Then in Kitty, I, um, started this project called Oxygen. Lots and lots of different things, uh, lots of um, uh, iconography and things like that. But then I uh, joined KDAB. Uh, I started doing a little bit of uh, a little bit more of the UI, UI and UX design. Um, started even more projects. Um, ended up having to starting to do um, uh, 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 a little bit more of uh, coding. Uh, uh, QML, 3D modeling, art, um, uh, uh, um, uh, management, that sort of thing. So over the years, yeah, we worked on lots of things. And I was trying to find things that I could show you guys of examples of work that I've done over the years. And it's complicated because I've done a lot of things and trying to pick one thing as an example is, is complicated. So I, I went for something that is totally bragging that I've very, very little responsibility about. Uh, but I, I, I really like to brag about it because this is, uh, a, a picture here from, um, the, the NASA insight lander emission. And, uh, the only thing there that is mine is the little window decoration around, um, around that window from the, 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 the NASA Insight Lander. Uh, but yeah, it totally made my year or, well, decade at least. Uh, so that, that was super fun to see. Um, but my, then, then I, I went on and tried to figure out the first thing I've done in, in, in embedded. And this, like, uh, this is, was the thing that I found out. So it, apparently it was in 2011. Um, and I'm pretty sure I did something before, but I, I couldn't find it. Um, and this was an interesting uh, little project, was a uh, server rack thingy uh that did video translation. And they wanted to, to start implementing something with uh, screens and a little bit uh, more of a uh, dynamic uh, UI. So what was... Uh, um, what was a rack with lots and lots of buttons, we turned it up into a, um, with something that still had lots and lots of buttons, but we managed to, to translate all, most of the UI interaction into just that little knob. And I found that that really helped the, the interaction uh, with the application. Obviously only 320 pixels by 240, that wasn't the, best user experience uh, of all times. I had to manually tweak the text a lot of times just so it could be readable, but that was uh, an interesting project. So we come, uh, we came a long way from, from those days. So this time, um, so the idea here is to give you a, a brief um, overview of uh, what designers do and a little bit about the specificities of the embedded space. Um, so what is this design thing? Because even if you ask me, I sometimes I struggle to find out what the hell is that I do because, um, there's a difference between understanding a method and, uh, and understanding there, there is a specific way of doing things and doing things. Um, sometimes we just do that, right? Um, uh, people present me as a, uh, uh, with a problem and I try to solve it. So I try to figure out like, is there a method to my madness? Do, do we think, is there a way that I somehow um, systematically approach this problem? Um, so, and apparently there is, which I found it interesting. Uh, obviously uh, I did some research and yeah, I'm not the only one thinking about this, shocker. Uh, and apparently a lot of other designers came up with very similar um, 
uh, breakdowns of uh, how we interact and how we 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 go about doing doing this UI UX thing, right? So this is a little bit of, about the the way they do it. Um, they usually uh, break things down into a kind of a research um, stage. Then after the research, we kind of create something, uh, um, and then we go and test it. Personally, how I break down things is uh, into, into three main objects. So first one, I call it context, um, which is to me understanding the problem. Then I move on to design with solving the problem. And then I go on to prototype, which is to test a solution. And uh, here we're going to go and dive in, into these three blocks and try to understand what, what goes on uh, in each one of them. First one, context. Um, uh, it's basically uh, divided into four parts and a very important warning. Uh, first one, uh, understanding the problem. Second, understanding the user. The, user. the third one is understanding the space. Uh, and the fourth, the, the specific hardware, uh, which is very important in the embedded space. But the most important thing um, that I have to say, um, and this I cannot stress this for, uh, enough, is to come to a problem as much as possibly with a blank, to, to be ignorant, to be clueless, to be silly, um, to ask all the wrong questions, um, because some of them actually might be the right ones, um, and not knowing anything about a specific problem. It's actually, um, I, it's very easy to come to a problem already knowing too much about it. It's, and when we know too much about a problem, we already have all of the answers, or we think we do. And, pro and sometimes they are not the correct ones. So um, if anything, if it's possible, try when presented with a UI that you have to design, you have to think about, try to arrive at, uh, to, arrive to it without uh, knowing anything, or at least in a schizophrenic way, Try to pretend that you don't know anything and try to construct, uh, construct a model uh, for this. Uh, because this takes me nicely to, to, to this, this, this thing, which uh, kind, of, kind of was um, how I came to design in the first place. So there, there's this division in, in, in application design that is the, the problem, I, I, I call it the problem versus features uh, uh, situation. So I started off as, as, uh, as a designer doing iconography. And back then, that is almost 15 years ago or something, um, iconography was what designers did for mostly in, the, in this space. Um, why? Because there were features. So developers were, would uh, work on their apps and create new features. And as soon as you create a new feature, you need a point of contact. So you need someone to make an icon so that they can expose a feature to the user, right? And, that, and that's the, a little bit the, what I did in the beginning. So I would go and ask the developer or the user, but usually it was the developer like, what is this feature? Was it supposed to do? And I would create some icon, some visual representation of the feature itself. Now, that wasn't really the, the correct way of doing things. Because uh, maybe maybe that feature um, could be bundled up with another feature because they were part of a problem solution. So maybe in a specific situation, you need to go through icon one and icon two to resolve a problem. But because you're exposing and you're thinking about your your UI in terms of the features you expose, you don't merge them together because you're, you, you sorted intellectually the, the application in terms of problems and features that I'm exposing, a very um, programmatic way of thinking. Versus when, when you think about the problem, you try to solve a problem. So the, the features is, is uh, just side uh, parameters to the problem solution. 
Um, if you look at this, this emergency button, um, you, you see kind of what I'm saying. Well, at least I hope you can see. So if you see this from a problem perspective, this emergency button is the thing that is going to prevent you. The problem is my finger is stuck on the machine and I'm going to lose my finger. I have a serious problem. You press that button. You see, you feel the urgency and the emergency of the need of this button. From a feature perspective, the feature is, oh, sometimes things go wrong. We need some way of stopping uh, whatever is going on. Less of an urgency. Maybe you don't even need this button for this feature. Um, maybe some sort of uh, semi-even um, icon uh, on your app would be enough, right? So there's actually, if you think in terms of what are we trying to do versus features we're trying to expose, it dramatically changes the way you see your application. Second thing that you should do, um, and it, it melds nicely with the, with the problem thing, is to be the user. So when you're trying to, to do this, you should try to um, become the user, to put yourself in the shoes of the user. And you, at least I do, uh, I kind of start to create this little person inside of me that is the, the person that is going to use it. And I'll start doing dialogues internally and sometimes not so much internally. Um, uh, with this, with this hypothetical, hypothetical user, there are some tricks that you can use, and that uh, UX people tend to to rely upon. And it's it's actually a helpful tool for everyone on a team to maybe create some personas. Um, and, and personas, very simply explained, is you pick. Uh, so you have a group, you have a distribution, you have a normal distribution of people, and you try to pick some personas, some individuals that would cover, let's say, 90% of your normal distribution, right? So you pick some individuals in your user space. Um, uh, it, they don't need to be real individuals, it's fake uh, individuals, but you write them down and you uh, say what they want, what they need, and if you uh, please those those two personas. Uh, in theory, you should please you know the the ninety five of it. it. It depends on the on the on where you pick those two personas, right? Uh, two, three, it depends, uh, right? Uh, another thing that you can do is create, uh, write some user scenarios. Uh, that's also helpful. It's just a way of maybe writing some problems really well because you write down some uh, user scenario where a specific problem uh, that is very common is written down and you test against that very well-defined user scenario. And you do a lot of testing. Test, I'll, I'll talk about testing a lot uh, because testing is fundamental. See people interacting with the current solution, with your solution, with... Um, with no solution, see how people struggle. Uh, don't judge, just look and try to understand what how the, the struggles of people because even the body language usually says a lot about uh, what they're really feeling. Space. Um, I'm in space. <laughs> uh, try to go there. If, if it's possible, try and in embedded space and like, unlike the, the desktop or the mobile space where we, well, in the desktop, we still kind of figure out that people are behind a desk, uh, probably, or deskish setup, but on a mobile, we have absolutely no control where people are. But on embedded is actually very different. The space actually exists. It, it might be a factory floor, it might be a car, it might be a washing machine, um, but the space exists and the space brings a lot of context and a lot of um, things that you can take into account. Uh, how you can actually know and see how much light there is, therefore you can think how much contrast you should have on your app. So um, try, if possible, to go there to see uh, the place where the application is going to be used because it's very helpful for your uh, development uh, and for your design. 
And finally, the hardware. Um, unlike, again, uh, the desktop, where the hardware tends to be out, completely outside of your scope, um, you just know that there's a keyboard, or and there's a screen, and there's a mouse, or in mobile, there's a touchscreen. Um, here, the hardware can actually change radically. Um, is it a touchscreen? Is a valid question. Is a touchscreen uh, capacitive, resistive? Very different ways of interacting. Um, does it come with a GPU? Can I use some fancy effects uh, on my code, or can't I? Um, what sort of CPU does it have? Is it fast, slow? Huh? Um, uh, do we have physical buttons? Seriously, um, it makes a huge difference. To, to is it is it supposed to interact with a physical button, um, or or is it completely touch? Or do we even have a screen? That sort of questions is um, fundamental to grasp and understand. Oh, and um, don't forget uh, to ask if. Can we change the hardware? Because sometimes the hardware is uh, predefined and you can't do anything about it, but sometimes it, it, there's a little bit of freedom to, to maybe even actually change the hardware. Maybe uh, if there was uh, someone was thinking more of a touch screen uh, experience, but then you go to the place and figure out, but people are using gloves and, uh, and, it, uh, and the screens are tiny. It doesn't work. So maybe... Um, Maybe simply doing the question um, is, uh, is uh, a good idea. Um, and this step, this step, this, this first step, this context step, is not quite quite finished. It goes on and should go on even to even even after the app is delivered and supposedly you have nothing to do with it anymore. Um, this this trying to understand the problem, refining the, the your understanding of a problem should never be finished. But having said that, um, you should be able to reply uh, to the five Ws, I would say in two to four days. Um, and the five Ws it are, it comes, it, it's, it comes from journalism. So in journalism, you should reply those five Ws in the first sentence of your, of your text. Um, it's used in other places as well. But I would say uh, here in that in the first, two to four days, you should be able to answer those five Ws. Why am I saying this? So I just said that you should go on this forever and ever, but, uh, but why am I saying that in, in the very beginning, you should already have a good idea um, and you should arrive at it fast because it's very easy to get confused, confused with details. The more information you put in, the more, oh, about, oh, how about this, oh, but there's also this situation and that sort of thing, tends to, to open our range to the problem and we start to have a very wide view and we don't focus on what is really important. That's why I think at the end of the two to four days of really trying your hardest to understand the scope of a problem, you really should uh, I wouldn't say stop, uh, but refrain from thinking too much about this context stage. Because you really now need to start solving it within the boundaries of your, of your acquired knowledge of the, that, that first stage. Or else um, it just gets confusing. And you end up, and you see that a lot of times. You see a lot of applications on multiple spaces where the first screen is littered with features, littered with icons, littered with um, stuff that uh, try to solve very small problems, very one-off type of, of, of things. And the, um, the application starts to get really cluttered and it becomes cluttered for everyone. It becomes cluttered for you and it becomes especially cluttered for the user that as in 95% of the times, no use for most of the features. Um, that that you see there. So try to to solve the main problem. Try to understand the main problem because that's that's the key. That's that's what really matters. So having those ninety percent done, uh, ninety percent done, uh, we can then move to design. And again, uh, in design, we can define some 
basic tax. Um, uh, some things that you have, have to achieve and do in the in the design stage. One, figure out the message. Um, uh, two, figure out the mood. Um, three, it's it's what um, people perceive as work. Uh, it's doing the lo-fi and i-fi uh, mockups um, for the application. The, thinking a little bit of the branding that is associated is something that I usually have to do. Um, um, and maybe coming up with a, a style guide is also a, a good idea. So, um, nothing here. Is it nothing here? Uh, no, not really. Um, and embedded space, uh, nothing comes out in a vacuum. Um, users have context, users have expectations. Um, so uh, nowadays people have expectation of uh, what a touch device should work and how it should work. They have expectations that um, you can swipe things, uh, you have things like burger menus, and if people, if people see a burger menu, they already know how they should interact with it. Um, so it's not true that there's nothing here, in, uh, uh, like I had in the first stage. Here, there's actually something. And as much as I love to be creative, um, it's actually a good idea to use common, uh, well-established um, UI norms and platforms and, and uh, ways of doing things. Uh, on the embedded space, there's this problem that unlike, say, a mobile where you're coming up from Android and you already know that you should use a little bit of the way of Android doing things, on iOS you should, do, you should use the way of iOS doing things, on the embedded space, there's a lot more freedom. And that it's a good thing sometimes and a bad thing at other times. So um, please try to be mindful, mindful of, um, of where to use, where some solution uh, that is brilliant is easy for the user to understand or not, depending on where he's coming from. Message. Um, this was an interesting uh, thing. So, um, when I'm thinking about uh, an application and trying to design an application, I think of the UI as a conversation. You're going to try to, so you, you know the problem, so you, you understood the 90% problem, and now you go a little bit schizophrenic and you pretend that you have two persons inside your brain and one is trying to explain the other, the user, um, what's going on. And it's like Pictionary, like you have pictures to show him and try to explain them, okay, you should do this and this is the way I'm going to help you solve the problem. Um, and, and, and this way of having a, a pseudo conversation with the user is something I use a, a lot. Um, and I think it works um, uh, quite well um, if you do it like this, uh, even though uh, people around you will look at you funny while you're doing conversations in the air. That's, that's it. <laughs> uh, mood. So because this is a conversation, um, you should try to use the right tone. Right? Uh, I'm doing a presentation, I'm trying to be funny. I'm not sure if I'm naming it, managing to do it. Uh, but yeah, uh, depending on the on the situation, we try to change the mood. As you can see here with these examples, uh, that um, different fonts, different coloring, do present different moods, different states of being. Um, so that's another thing that you should try to use, is trying to set uh, the correct mood, the best mood for whatever you're trying to communicate with the, with the user. Is this, um, is this a application that should that, that is light and not very um, um, very um, I would say mission critical? Um, then maybe use a more playful font, some playful um, 
uh, uh, colors, um, use color theory. There's there's books about color theory. There's way too many books about typography. Um, uh, but you can use that all of that knowledge in order to to say something in the correct uh, way or in the way that serves you best for the um, for the for what you're trying to solve and are trying to help the user. There's, there's this sentence um, I love from a hair song with um, how does it make you feel? Um, and that's that's what I kind of ask. I, I kind of ask when I'm trying, I'm sorry, I'm designing and I'm, I'm in the first stages of the nail designing an app, I look at it and I just squint my eyes and I say, and I try to understand how does it make me feel? It's okay, I know this is a little bit, um, if it to to define, yeah, that's how kind of designers work. At least I work. Um, and then you start to design things. So this is um, uh, what I'm showing here is from my new auction style. Um, um, so the, just just uh, a thing. So that, what I'm trying to say here is that then you. With all this knowledge and all these rules defined, you start to really tackle the problem. And usually me, personally, how I do it is that I, I go straight to doing high fidelity mockups for, um, say, the main page, the, the welcome page uh, or, and the home page. Why do I do that? Because... Um, because I have to, because that sets, as I said, the mood uh, for the application, uh, and I can already kind of test if um, if things are going to work. I can also test scalability. So I know my ninety percent of the problem. I have some idea there are some other problems that I might have to 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 put in uh, into my UI. So because I'm already doing AI fidelity, aka it's a it's it's what the app should look like um, as much as possible and as realistically as possible. Um, I already have to think about the scalability. How am I going to provide more features here? How am I going to have other pages in this uh, in this home page? Uh, are the, are the, how will the user f flow from here to another to another place? So I usually start off with doing the high fidelity mockup. Um, and out of that mockup, uh, then the other stuff um, will will come out. So maybe for the sub pages, uh, now that I'm already trying to do the sub pages, I don't need that without mockup because well, the components have been defined. Uh, now I'm already thinking about the prototyping stage. Uh, I already defined the main the main visual elements that it will keep on being reused. I already defined the mo the, the most common. Uh, interaction uh, patterns uh, in my application, uh, so um, so I can just not do high fidelity mockups for everything else. Plus, they are a lot of work to do. So yeah, but good idea to avoid them. And I also will do a couple of flows. Uh, flows are just schematics of uh, from this page. We have three contact points for the next page, and so on and so forth. Um, and and that's it. Uh, this this is how uh, we do this stage. Um, be mindful uh, when you do this of the context. Um, it's it's very different if you're doing something for a car, if you're doing that for an assembly line, or if it's just a little button on a wall. Um, uh, a touch screen in front of your face uh, is okay. Uh, for a for a yes no question, right? So imagine that you have just say a a little dial that you're going to turn the light on or off, and uh, that's fine. But um, if you're supposed to write your first your maiden uh, your mom's maiden name there, it it wouldn't be very um, Nice to use because you you're, you have to think about the ergonomics of, of, of how things work. Because you're going to have your end in the air and you're going to try to type in and it's very tiresome. Do you remember the minority report? That thing is like a plague, uh, the, the movie. 
So everybody, after that movie, everybody wanted UIs like the Minority Report. Um, I, I'm not sure if people understand quite well how fun it is to have your arms waving in the air for hours and hours uh, without an end. Uh, probably not the, the, the most enjoyable of experiences. It did look nice in the, in the movie, though. Um, so yeah, uh, as you uh, design your solution, you should also think about how it's going to be used uh, and who's going to use it uh, and what interactions do you uh, hope to get into your application. One last thing, um, and this is very important, uh, the nine millimeter thing. Um, this nine millimeter thing it, it comes to uh, touch versus keyboard type of thing, uh, type of separation. So in a touch um, environment, your objects, your clickable objects should be around nine millimeters um, squares because that's the size of your finger, um, versus on a non-touch uh, UI, the limitation factor tends to be the readability of text. Uh, that's, that's your main uh, uh, definition, the definer of, of sizes is, well, I, can I read the text or can't I read the text? Uh, branding, okay. Um, Usually there's there's some sort of customer, and you you design things. They probably add some branding style guidelines that you should look and read, and infuse that a little bit into your app because it it's supposed to. It's right. It's, uh, the apps is supposed it has a um, it belongs to a to a bigger ecosystem, and it's it's probably a good idea to try to infuse the the the. Um, the style guidelines of the of that uh, brand into your into your design, which takes me um, to my final step on on this uh, on this thing, which is to develop maybe a application style uh, guide, and it, it's basically a continuation of the style guideline from the from the the brand, and you just do this one for your application. It's very it's helpful. Um, to to lay these things down, so it's you you set boundaries for yourself as you design things because you've designed it. You you uh, define the palette, you define a couple of of components, you define some fonts that you should you're supposed to use, and yeah, it. Um, uh, whenever I have time, I like to do this these things. And with all this done, you should go and start to prototype. So um, let's uh, make things real. Um, and the first step is, and again, the steps things, the steps that I usually take is importation. Then I, I'll do QML. Uh, well, we're talking about Qt, so uh, and I only know how to code in QML, so don't ask me about C++. Um, then I'll try to deploy uh, the thing, um, testing, testing. Uh, and then sharing whatever I've done. So import. The import stage nowadays is starting to get a little bit simpler. Um, uh, Kit Design Studio has automatic importers for Sketch, Photoshop. I'm broken. <laughs> I've been doing this for a little bit too many, for too long. Um, so I do it all manually. I like the, the easiness, the, the the power of, uh, of having a little bit more control. If you used one of those import um, um, thingies, but they are great. They are really good way for you to start to learn how to code and start to learn how to use QML, um, even without coding, because they, uh, they are starting to allow you to do a lot of things without actually touch a single line of code, which is a good thing. Um, but yeah, I, I'm broken. I already know QML, and uh, if I want to move something 20 pixels, I go to the line of code where the position is defined, and it'll just add 20 <laughs> um, instead of moving it 20 pixels on a uh, what you see is that you get a type of UI. Uh, and then you code, right? Um, uh, 
Uh, this again, uh, an example of, of something I'm doing for the the kid style, the, the um, oxygen style two or to the square. Um, and here is where, well, at least where I have fun. This is really the most fun aspect of the entire thing. So this is where you pick up the, um, the pieces of the designer, which usually tends to be me as well, and you figure out how do you scale it up? How do you put those things into action and start to construct the the high, the high fidelity mock-up that you were given by the designer into something that resembles an app. This is a this is great, and I think all designers should do it because designers cheat. We cheat a lot. Designers pick up the perfect text that meets the correct, the visual criteria that makes the thing look great. It's the perfect text, immutable and unchangeable. Right, but reality doesn't work like that. <laughs> and text changes, context changes. And when you start to implement these things and you try to do a little prototype, even if it's the worst code in the world, you test it and you test it against reality. You even start to gain some empathy for your developer friends uh, that have to struggle with explaining you this over and over again. Um, so, um, Try to do this. This is uh, one of the steps uh, that uh, I think uh, are are sometimes missed. Even even in simplified prototypes, um, the ones that uh, you can do uh, purely on the on the design side of Qt Design Studio or Qt Creator, um, is to what if the text changes? What if this? What if that? Uh, because if you prototype just say a a an action, a kind of a movie. Uh, you're still cheating as a designer. You're still narrowing the the field of what might be, uh, go wrong by just um, uh, scripting something that always goes in the same way. Oh right, um, uh, checking my notes here. Uh, for embedded, um, I like to try to mimic uh, whatever is going to be my solution. So I can mimic my keyboard action, uh, special buttons with the keyboards. Um, I, I can also, and I do that uh, quite often, if it's for touch, I'll deploy, um, even if the screen doesn't match, uh, sometimes I go and deploy a version of the app into, say, an iPad or an, some some big touch device, and I'll simulate the screen there, and I'll simulate the interaction of it in a in a non pixel to pixel, but in a perfect uh, centimeters to centimeter scale. So the screen, even though it might be uh, not pixel perfect, it will be centimeters perfect. So you test the, your your solutions against some physical object. And that takes me to to the to the to the testing phase. Um, uh, animations. Uh, I forgot to mention animations. Animations are a key uh, important thing um, uh, in real life. Nothing is instant. That is weird. Um, uh, our brain doesn't kind of like that uh, because this this instant action is kind of weird. Um, so. Think of the animations as another way of pointing uh, as transitions to do transitions that are smooth and normal and not weird. So a good animation is the ones that you actually don't notice because um, animations are a good way to bring attention to something. So if, if you have a static screen and a little bit of it is animated, you, the eyes of the user will be drawn to that like hawks. Uh, yeah, because we're still in the jungle, and if there's something, some leaves moving, danger. Um, so that's that's one way of using animation sometimes in our benefit. Sometimes you can use it to point a user into one direction or another direction um, by using animation as a little bit of a tool for that. Um, so yeah, uh, think that and test that in the prototype stage. Um, also, uh, deploy. Uh, deploy is... Try to find try to find some 
uh, proxy. If you can't get the real embedded hardware into your room, and yet yeah, usually they don't send that to the designers because yeah, you just you're supposed only to make things pretty. Um, try to get uh, similar enough hardware so that you can test against uh, the limitations of the hardware because it's it's. It's a little bit frustrating to come up with this amazing um, UI with lots of bells and whistles, and it's great. And then you put it on the real device, and it's one frame per second. So all that work into your marvelous animations, and yeah, they are animated at one frame per second. So this comes with a little bit of experience. So with with experience, you know, okay, this sort of hardware has this limitations. I can do it this way. Uh, this sort of hardware is fine. I can do it whatever I want to. I actually tested on a little bit of machines, but um, experience does help here a lot. If you can get the correct hardware and you can get someone to help you with deployment of your cute stuff there, awesome. And test. This is one of the good things, right? So now you can test uh, your solution. So you had a problem, you develop a, a solution, now uh, you implemented this solution, and now you get to test it. So first you test. As you, as you do things, as you make an animation, you, as you do it, you press play and you see, is it working? And you think, yeah, no, maybe and you get your personal bias about it. Uh, but then you go and start to share this with your colleagues and your users, right? So you have your prototypes and you're going to test it with your users to see if the thing is actually working or not working. And this is the share bit. So um, all of this uh, gets now starts to go uh, upstream. Um, and you get to you get to test your 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 stuff, and things are starting to work. And that takes me to to the last point, um, which is to um, I, I actually said that um, we would have uh, three point five steps, right? Um, where's the point five step? The point five step is the most important one. Uh, the point five step is that. Um, I really struggled uh, with this concept of the, of the three monolithic uh, blocks. Um, and I struggled over the years with this because it tended to be that uh, uh, different people would do different spaces of that thing. And so you would have the conceptualization, the context stuff done by the group of people, uh, the, the, and they would do it. They would write and create some documentation about it and pass it along to the next stage. Um, and this kind of um, gets really the per person, the, the, the people that do this. And as we do this, we just do our job and, instead, and we dissociate ourselves from the problem. So we've done our job. Next. And it was fine. Uh, uh, and because the thing was created like that as monolithic blocks, um, um, it kind of it, it kind of provides itself to to work like that. And I struggle with this a lot because people seem like sometimes they don't care about the problem, and they're not willing to spend um, way too much time <laughs> freaking out about the little animation. Crazy people. Um, but uh, this 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 Kioma way of doing things and the possibility to share it and the possibility to implement a design from from the designer and send it over C and tell him you're an idiot you tested way too small text and this is how it worked for real text um, helps it uh, and people start to get uh, to not detach themselves from the project because this this now starts to flow. Uh, across across the, the design platform, and across all designers using maybe using Cube Creator as your common language for everybody to talk. Plus, mm, huge use bonus. Um, your developers can pretend that you didn't specify how a specific button should work. It's there. It's in the code. Uh, it might be the worst code in the universe, 
but it's there and it's supposedly working pretty much as you want it to and the design team wants it to. And the user has feedback that he really likes that specific implementation of the button. So um, you don't have to write a huge amount of uh, text specs to explain that. Um, and uh, it's uh, maybe good or bad for the developer uh, downstream. And we can also have the implementation from the developer. So this, this enables an entire flow uh, across, across everybody. Um, and right, so this was um, my talk. Um, uh, the key things that you should take away, uh, again, is understand the problem, uh, the problem without any bias. Seriously, the bias thing is a problem. Um, then you go there, you solve it, you test it, you ensure it. Um, uh, and uh, that's it. Thanks, Thanks for, any questions? for this uh, different insights uh, when working in Embedded. Um, to all our viewers, you can still ask questions to Nuno right, um, right now in the right of your stream on the platform. We already collected some questions. The first one um, to Nuno. Uh, in Embedded, just like in any other industries, we have companies knowing their field really well. They've probably amounted experience over very many years already in their products, right? Maybe there was a product that wasn't being digitized so far. Now there should be a digital version of this. Um, this knowledge does not directly come from the users of the product, right? It was kind of collected by designers, maybe even before you as when you come in as a designer. Um, how can one profit from this implicit knowledge and how can we get it out of those experts? Maybe don't they don't tell you or they are not able to tell you. Is there this situation that they know that? A very good question. Uh, it, that's very common and uh, comes to usually when um, we're migrating. Um, one of the one of the worst problems, good problems, is the um, the expectation of the users. For example, um, right. a user uh, will. So we have we have this. We come to a factory floor, and the users have been using a system for many many years. Um, and they have expectations, right? Oh, it worked like that. I don't want to learn anything. Humans are kind of a step we don't like to, to change for sake of not changing. So if you do it, like I said, like completely blank, um, you're going to piss off a lot of people. <laughs> you're going to piss off the people that uh, are and that have been working on this for years and years uh, because you're going to, oh, say, be a little bit of an idiot and say, you're doing everything wrong. <laughs> Uh, and it really puts off your users because they are, why are you doing this differently for the sake of doing it differently? So, yeah, take what I just said in the beginning about being complete bank with a grain of salt. Um, you should be coming at completely blank, but try to see what is the established knowledge in a specific field, in a specific company, uh, because as I said in the following uh, slide, you should take into consideration what people already know. I was mentioning uh, the embedded people know uh, know mobile space and desktop space and a little bit of the of the um, interaction patterns there, but that is also valid for um, for the previous knowledge uh, of a specific solution. Um, you talked in your approach about kind of this zero point five step being interact, uh, in iterative uh, in, your, yeah. um, in your design. Um, so knowing uh, hardware people, um, how large is the clash between this hardware development, which inherently kind of is streamlined towards a product and kind of goes on in steps rather than in circles, um, or the hardware development mindset. So how hard in your experience is the clash um, uh, talking to those people who develop hardware and um, yeah, talking to a de designer who wants to come back every time. Is this a problem or is this not a problem because yeah. we're talking about software or? Yeah, it, it is a problem. Um, it, is, it is a problem even not, uh, not only with the hardware people, um, even with the software people. 
designers are a little bit silly. It's a good thing. It's it's good to experience experiment and be playful, but um, uh, nailing designers into a specific solution and setting boundaries is sometimes hard. So maybe the the the, the, um, the designer knows that there's some point where you should stop, but I, I, I don't want to say um, to plot the designers to be creative, because if you transform a designer into being someone very straight and very focused, you don't get the best designs. Um, it's actually a good thing that you're playful. So you have to balance these things out. So yeah, someone needs to tell the designer, shut up <laughs> and, and follow and get that we need some sort of solution um, at some point. Uh, but I don't cut the, 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 the designer completely and make him into a little machine of just making things pretty that, no. Um, last question. What if the color companies are just a bad choice? Let's say a light yellow on white. And how do you approach such a conflict between kind of branding and usability design? <laughs> Personal joke. Uh, <laughs> so you're already laughing. Because you know my solution. Make it black. <laughs> no, that, that's, that, um, that's complicated. Uh, from a branding perspective, the branding uh, color scheme is sometimes awful. Uh, the problem is a little bit upstream, right? It, it's not your fault. You have to deal with it. You have to try to, to make it work uh, with, uh, with the existing guidelines. Um, maybe hint to the customer or to have whoever is in, as a responsibility that maybe they should have a look at their uh, branding. Uh, but you're going to comply with it. It's just one of the limitations. It's, it's again, a bit like the hardware. So if you say, can I have better hardware? And the person in charge says, no, there's the end of discussion. <laughs> no, I can't. Uh, and this is kind of similar. So can I have different colors? No. Okay. I have to manage with the colors that uh, were provided to me. That's it.